What's up? Good morning. You guys still with us? You still awake? Good. I like it. Hey, I just got to say from the start, for the record, that not only is that woman one of my favorite preachers in the world, I also find her absolutely stunningly gorgeous. And I can say that, and it's not weird, because she is my wife, all right? That's right. I'm not just claiming it, though. I got picture proof for you. Somebody snapped this of us about a month ago at a wedding. It's my favorite picture ever, officially. That's my bride, her name is Beth, and she will actually be here in a few hours, and she's gonna be preaching tonight. It's gonna be great, y'all, I can't wait. So much fun to partner together with her. We actually teach together at Ozark Christian College, and our offices are across the hall, but summer's crazy, so we're apart from each other a bunch, so I can't wait for her to be here, and for you to meet her, and for us to be able to spend some time ministering to you together. Speaking of which, I try to be careful not to say this too often, but what I'm talking to you about this morning has the potential to save you not only like thousands of dollars in therapy, but um, decades of striving for a goal, a finish line that you could never possibly reach. But as with most treasures of the soul, they're kind of surprisingly easy to miss. See, our word for the day actually names something that is sought by every single human being who has ever lived. I'm not going to try to be secretive. I'll tell you the word. The word of the day is justification. Now, you guys were great yesterday with regeneration. So if you would say justification. justification. Well done. Again. And one more time. That's our word for, to the, for the day, today, this morning, justification. I want to read to you a couple of passages from Paul's letter to the Romans where he mentions this. I'm going to read Romans 3, 28, and then I'm going to read Romans 5, 1 and 2. Here's what Paul says a couple of different times, just so you can see the word in Scripture. 3, 28, Romans says, for we maintain that a person is justified, there's the word, by faith apart from the works of the law. Skipping ahead to the beginning of chapter 5, he actually repeats himself. He says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. That is justification. It's actually a legal term. I don't know how many of you have have been in an actual courtroom, but you guys have seen this on TV. You kind of get how this works. There's some key roles in the courtroom. You know, like up front, there's the judge. I guess the person who decides the case. Sometimes you have a jury, sometimes it's just the judge, but the judge is sort of like the symbolic voice of authority in the courtroom. And then you've got two sides to this. You've got the prosecution, which is trying to prove that the defendant is guilty, and then you've got the defense, which is trying to prove that the defendant is innocent. And they set about their various arguments, call their witnesses, and then at a certain point, what's been said, what's, what's going to be said has been said, and so it's on the judge to offer a verdict. And the judge comes out and he offers a verdict. One of two things, either guilty or not guilty. To be justified is to be declared not guilty. Or to put it in positive terms, to be justified is to be declared righteous. Justification and righteous are actually the same word in the language in which the Bible was originally written in the Greek New Testament. So, So to be justified means that the judge comes out and declares you not guilty which means you're now going to be treated as an innocent person. You're not gonna be welcomed back into favor of the judge and society as someone who will not be treated as having committed the crime. Problem, you're not righteous. Like you have, quote unquote, committed the crime. You're you're not innocent. We, We covered this last night. Frank did a good job of helping us think our way through this and feel our way through this. And I don't know what your cup looks like. I left mine backstage. He gave us some categories, whether it's because of a desire for comfort or control or approval or power. We don't need to go back over the details, but I think we probably have all come face to face with the fact that perfection is not a word that describes our life on the inside or the outside. So you don't deserve justification. How can you be declared not guilty if you're actually guilty? That's a problem, except that's not actually a problem because in this courtroom, that's the point. This is the heart of the gospel. Christianity is it's not just good advice, it's good news. The good news that Christ died for you. I remember having a conversation with my son about this just the other day. My son and daughter will both be here today as well. Can't wait to squeeze them. And we were talking about, he, I don't even remember what we were talking about, but he was talking about, you know, trying to be good and, and whether he's ready to be baptized. And, and he said something that made me think like he kind of thinks that the point of Christianity is be, being good enough to, to go ahead and serve God. And I kind of clarified for him. I said, but you know, you know, the word do and the word done, right? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, like, um, 
You know, sometimes people say, and this is true, that Christianity is not about what you do for God. It's about what God has done for you in Jesus. Does that make sense? And he was like, yeah. He was like, do they say that? Because like do is in done, but done is bigger. So like what God does is bigger, but what we do is part of like what he does in us. And I'm like, you're eight. <laughs> you're like, where do you, you're brilliant, you know? But like he's, he's getting the point that Jesus experienced divine judgment for sin so that you wouldn't have to, so that you might not experience that divine judgment, so that you might be justified, so that you might be forgiven. This is actually in the context of the first verse that we read just a moment ago. As with all of these passages, there's lots of details, but it doesn't hurt to see a few more of them. Romans chapter three, backing up a bit, Paul actually says, for all have sinned, this is verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We talked about that last night. And all are justified, there's that word, as a gift by grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Then he comes back around in 28 and says it again. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. I know there's a lot of big words in there, but you're big kids, you can get the logic. When he says we maintain, that word actually means we calculate, we've done the math. We've realized that we don't deserve the gift of grace that God has given us, but that's what makes it grace. And because Jesus died in our place, we're now invited into God's face, like that's the gospel. That's justification. It's not that what you do doesn't matter. No, 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 not at all. It's that your acceptance by God is not determined by your moral performance. It's not determined by how well you keep the list, by how hard you serve, by how perfect you keep your track record. No, that's justification by works. Christianity is justification by grace through faith, through faith. It's not about you doing enough to earn God's favor and presence. It's about God offering you his love and forgiveness and presence when you deserve nothing and then walking by faith in him. Do you understand this means that the pressure's off? Do you understand this means that God doesn't expect you to be perfect? That you don't have to fear always being in trouble with him? You're justified by grace through faith. New problem, who cares? Like I, I know you care now. But I'm not just concerned with what you're thinking and feeling right now. Because we can't stay in this room, nor are we supposed to stay in this room. We're supposed to go back. Like, who cares a week from now, a month from now, six months from now, a year from now, when you find yourself in a situation where the truth of the gospel doesn't feel as directly relevant to your life. Maybe it's a situation where you're in temptation. Like you wanna do something that you know God doesn't want you to do. You can fill in the blanks here. In that situation, you can sort of imagine yourself there, whatever it might be for you. And then if you were to have this voice that said, hey, but don't forget, like you're justified by grace through faith. So? Or maybe it's a situation where your life is falling apart. Maybe your family is in a terrible place. Maybe mom or dad left or somebody around you died or things are chaotic and your future is unraveling and you really are just stressed beyond all measure and you have good reason to do so. And you hear this voice that says, hey, you're justified by grace through faith. So? Or maybe your life is great. You do get all of the things that you want. You do get the guy, get the girl, get the scholarship, get the win, whatever it is. And then some voice comes to you and says, don't forget, you're justified by grace through faith. So? There's a pastor in New York who tells the story about a time when this family came to him and they said, we'd like to ask you to talk to our daughter. Their daughter's probably 12, 13 years old, a little bit younger than, than all of you. And they said, she's just kind of going through a rough time in her life. And we figure maybe you could help. So he says, sure, bring her on in. So she comes into his office and he's just kind of, you know, kind of listening to what's going on in her life. Says, sweetheart, tell me what's happening. And she talks about how, you know, she's grown up in church and she tries to be a good girl, but things are getting hard because she's in junior high. And, you know, uh, her friends are being mean and the boy that she likes doesn't like her and the boy that she likes actually likes her friend and all this kind of stuff. You guys remember junior high. Some of these things can be stressful, you know. And uh, he actually was, uh, was just really compassionate to her. And, and he had actually, in the previous week's sermon, he had just kind of laid out the gospel about how God accepts us by grace and all the stuff we're talking about today. And he asked her, well, you know, were you at church on Sunday? And she said, yes. And he figures, okay, well, I can just kind of reinforce the message. I'm sure she didn't hear it super well, so I'll tell it to her and see if it helps. And he says, well, what'd you hear me say? He said, she laid out the gospel as clearly as anybody who he's ever heard say it. So it was perfect, it was beautiful. And then he asked her after she said the gospel so well, does this, does this make you feel better? 
And she just kind of looked at him like something's wrong with him. And she said, well, no. Did you not hear what I just said? The boy I like doesn't like me. <laughs> he likes my friend instead. Like, what's going on in this situation? The problem is not that she fails to grasp the concept. The problem is that she keeps the concept out here. She pushes the truth away from the center of who she is. It's not invited into her identity. Somebody once said that the longest distance in the world is about 15 inches from right here to right here. And what we gotta do, what we gotta do if we're gonna do more than just go through the spiritual motions, what we gotta do if we're gonna mean this, is find a way to move from, I agree that this is true, to yes, and now this will define me. If you're gonna take justification to heart, you gotta let the cross of Christ define your worth. Let his death define your identity. Let the gospel tell you who you are. It's a process, right? It doesn't just happen in a day. Like it starts by letting God's opinion of you define you. I am who God says I am. I'm not who you say I am. I'm not who my detractors say I am. I'm not who my friends say I am or even who my wife says I am. I am who God says I am. You gotta let God's opinion of you tell you who you are. But you can't just stop there. You gotta go another step and let Christ's death determine God's opinion of you. You gotta have both. I am who God says I am, and God sees me through the cross. If you only have the first, if you define yourself as God sees you, but you don't think God sees you through the cross, you, oh man, you may do a lot for God, but your inner life will be, you, you will live in fear, you will be well acquainted with guilt, and you may serve God, but you will not like him very much. On the other hand, if you hold on to the second, but not the first, if you believe that God sees you through the cross, that the death of Christ determine what God thinks of you, but you're letting something other than God's opinion of you define you, like you'll be like the girl in the story. You'll believe the gospel in theory, but it won't actually do anything. It won't actually matter to you because you're trying to find your identity and worth and value and justification in something else. You see, justification is not just a religious thing. It's an everybody thing. The desire to be justified is hardwired into the human psyche. Think about how we sometimes use the word. You might talk about a justified vacation or a justified purchase or a justified nap or a justified dessert. Oh, I know I'm eating a second piece of chocolate cake, but it's justified because I ran this morning. You know what I'm saying? And what are we saying whenever we use that language? We're saying, I have done enough to earn this. That's the question. And if you look closely enough, you might see that we do this with our lives as a whole. Why else? Would athletes sometimes feel empty when their careers end? How come successful people can't slow down, even when it's killing them? Why do you feel so bad about yourself on days when you're unproductive or underappreciated? Why do you work so hard to feel important? Why do you care so deeply about how you appear in the eyes, not of everybody, but of the few people whose approval you seek? Usually we don't say, oh, I'm trying to justify my existence. We just say to ourselves, one more, and that'll be enough. One more book read, one more weightlifting record, one more new friend, one more admirer, one more compliment, one more A plus, one more scholarship, one more victory, one more joke that lands, one more and I'll be fine, then I'll be safe, then I'll be secure, then people will be impressed, then they will like me, then God will like me, then I'll be enough. I don't mean to yell at you guys. I really don't, I'm sorry if I am. <laughs> it's just that I don't think the question is if we seek justification, but how? That's what I think we need to see if we're gonna let the truth of the gospel go from here to here. So one more time, religion says, if I do enough good works, maybe God will accept me. Jesus says, you are declared righteous in me. God accepts you because I died for you. Trust me. That sounds like something I want. This is something we need.